Snake, Peace Walker is the heart of the enemy's project. To prevent its completion, you'll need to either shut down or destroy the artificial intelligence that functions as its brain. According to Huey, that AI is now undergoing final calibrations in Strangelove's lab. It's inside a tropical cloud forest. Slip in and terminate that AI before they ship it out. We've also confirmed that some of the enemies specialize in ambushes. Amanda's crew calls them scouts. They'll blend themselves in with the terrain and the vegetation. Then, when they see you, they'll swoop in. They fight pretty much like commandos, and will use clearing techniques to flush you out. In addition to wielding normal weapons, the scouts also carry wires. <sighs> Sounds like these guys know their CQC. Could be. We've been getting reports of CQC attacks being blocked by wires. Stay alert. Are there any large-scale ruins in Costa Rica, Paz? There is a place east of Cartago called Guajabu. They have ruins there, but they're not especially big. Hmm. Not the place I'm thinking of. Any others? Well... If you go a little way across the border, into Nicaragua, there is a place called La Fortaleza de la Inmaculada Concepción. That is the only famous one. Then what were those ruins I saw from up on Irasu? There are a lot of things we still do not know about Costa Rica's ancient civilizations. There are giant stone spheres throughout the country. What they were used for is still a mystery. The cloud forests cover the central mountainous region of the country. They are perpetually shrouded in fog. You get wet just standing there. It is as if the entire forest is inside a cloud. Must make for poor visibility. It does, but beauty too. It is like being lost in some mystical green labyrinth. I'd rather not get lost if that's okay. The forests are also home to lots of rare animals, especially bright colored frogs. They like the humidity. You know that butterfly painted on Peace Walker? Any idea what that is? It is a morpho. A Palladius morpho, if I'm not mistaken. Palladius morpho? Uh-huh. It is the most common type of morpho in Costa Rica. Huh. It has these gorgeous metallic blue wings that shimmer in the light. You can see them even from a distance. You mean they reflect light? Correct. It is called structural color. Morpho scales have tiny bumps on them that interfere with the light and make them look blue. The space between the bumps corresponds to the wavelength of the blue light. Let me see if I get this. So if you could change the spacing, you'd end up seeing a different color. That is the principle. I heard somewhere it is being researched as a way to color cloth without dye. Think of the camouflage you could make with that. Is that all you can think of? Hey, it's important. What I don't get is why they'd put a butterfly on Peace Walker. Maybe because it looks pretty. I hope that's all it is. This area is a tropical cloud forest, continually covered in a thick mist. It is quite a mystical place. Selva de la Leche. Forest of milk. I can barely see in front of me. There you go again. The forest is basically sitting in a cloud, so of course it's going to be hard to see. But you know, the cloud forest is the only place many exotic creatures can live. Well, if they're not edible, I'm not interested. Snake, I'll have you know people travel from all around the world to witness Costa Rica's unique fauna. Snake. Watch out for the frogs. Why? They bite? Relax. No frogs ever eaten a snake. Although, I've feasted on a few frogs' legs myself. But they are dangerous. They are poisonous. Poisonous? Poison dart frogs live up to their name, I assure you. 
Their poison is so strong. The Indigena use them to make poison-tipped arrows. Some secrete poison through their skin. Even touching them can be dangerous. So don't go petting them or anything. Yeah, so... I can't eat one. I am warning you. From here on in, you'll be in a cloud forest. The ground is covered in vegetation. You'll have plenty of hiding places, but so will the enemy. I'll keep an eye out for scouts. Trying to force your way through would be suicide. Know the enemy's location before making any moves. Too bad you don't have some sort of radar. Hmm. I could try night vision. Once you know where an enemy is, decide how you want to handle him. You could get into his blind spots. Or drop him from a distance before he even has a clue someone's around. An eye for an eye, right? Chico, you know much about cloud forests? Mm, not that much. All I know is there's a world of difference between a rainy rainforest and a foggy cloud forest. But they have some things in common. But like, for instance, you gotta watch out for poison dart frogs. Both rain and cloud forests have high humidity, so they're perfect environments for frogs and other amphibians. I mean, it's not like just touching a strawberry poison dart frog or a dying dart frog is going to kill you. But don't eat them no matter how hungry you get. I can get all the rations I need from Mother Base. No jungle food for me this time. Seriously? You're not disappointed you don't get to eat wild animals? <laughs> what do you think I am? <laughs> Just kidding. In Colombia, though, there's a frog, the golden dart frog that's lethal to the touch. How do you know all this? Come on. Don't you think poisonous animals are cool? Not if you get poisoned by one. Well, obviously. One more thing. When you get to the forest, be on the lookout for Bigfoot. I... I... think I'll be okay there. <laughs> Bigfoot is an ape man that lives in the Rocky Mountains. In the local Indian language, he's known as Sasquatch. And get this, he's over three vara. Can you believe that? So, he's... Kind of like a gorilla. Completely different. Even the biggest gorillas only get to about two vara, and they walk on their knuckles. Bigfoot's big, and he walks on two feet, like people. So, he's more man than ape. Probably. His ancestors must have split off from humans at some point. Like, before they started using tools and stuff. Yeah, but aren't the Rockies kind of far away from here? Eh, not that far. According to Darwin, humans came all the way over here from Africa. Plus, there have been sightings in Venezuela of an ape man called Mono Grande. Costa Rica has tons of plant and animal species, so I'd expect there to be at least one kind of ape man. At least. Gotta admit, I've never heard of Mono Grande. Yeah, he's not as famous as Bigfoot. He's similar, but he lives in Venezuela. He's not that big, less than two vara, but he's way more ferocious than Bigfoot. Huh. I wonder just how mean he is. Like, like when he catches his prey, does he punch it to death? That's the law of the wild. You catch your prey, you kill it, and you eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But punching is way more ferocious than biting. Well, maybe it seems that way, because that's what humans do. You really love UMAs, don't you, Chico? Do you know what I think? I think UMAs should be dangerous. Otherwise, where's the fun in hunting them? I'm starting to sense your feelings about nukes are a little different from your colleagues. How do you mean? Mm, your little chat with Coldman back there. I... told you my father worked on the Manhattan Project, right? You're familiar with it? Mm, the basics, yeah. It was the project that kicked off the nuclear age. That's right. Some of the finest minds of the 20th century, including multiple Nobel Prize winners, worked on it. They spent over two billion dollars, and that's in 1940s money. It culminated in the successful nuclear test at Alamogordo on July 16, 1945. And the first use in combat a few weeks later. <sighs> Doc? I can't walk. What? My spine isn't shaped like everybody else's. 
I can't move my lower body. So I've never taken a single step, not since I was born. What's that got to do with your dad being in the Manhattan Project? As a result of his research, my father was exposed to high doses of radiation. It can't be a coincidence that my chromosomes are messed up. Uh, that's... Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't want for these nukes to be another sword of Damocles. I wanted to give them a real purpose, to be a deterrent against war. Doc. And Coldman... We have to stop him, whatever it takes. August 6th, 1945, Hiroshima. August 9, Nagasaki. The atom bomb attacks on Japan. My father was married to his work. I don't have a single memory of going places or doing stuff with him on weekends. But even as a kid, I knew on some level that it was for his family. I respected him. My mother used to tell me all the time, your father is a brilliant scientist. He saved countless American boys from death. You should be proud of him. Yeah. You could say the war ended because of those bombs. When I was in the fifth grade, a Japanese student transferred to our class. She showed me photos of Hiroshima after the bomb. I couldn't believe my eyes. A city of over 350,000 people reduced to a scorch mark on the ground by a single atomic bomb. Houses blown off their foundations burned to ashes. The only things left standing were the skeletons of steel-framed buildings. And it wasn't just the buildings. Blackened corpses on the side of the road. Survivors covered head to toe in severe burns. Within a few months, over 70,000 had died in Nagasaki. Twice that in Hiroshima. For years after that, I couldn't talk to my father. Couldn't even stand to look at his face. I know how you feel, Doc. But your father's your father. If he hadn't worked on that project, my body wouldn't be like this. I could be researching something else. I could have lived a normal life. <sighs> it wasn't so long ago the world stood on the brink of nuclear war. Just over on the other side of the Caribbean. I was 17 at the time. I'd skipped a few grades and was a sophomore at MIT. I remember feeling kind of apathetic about the news that came in every day. It seemed clear to me that as long as they had a grasp of the concept of nuclear deterrence, there was nothing to fear. Mm, either that, or they were fanning that fear on purpose. As a way to secure a bigger defense budget? Huh, I can see that. But if that was their plan, it kind of backfired. Because it ushered in the era of detente between East and West. Coldman's really gonna do it this time. Once the nuclear genie is out of the bottle, the yoke of deterrence is going to be meaningless. People will die. Cities will burn. We have to stop him now before it's too late to turn back. So you've been doing nuclear research your whole life? No, not really. At first I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. For me, the Sputnik launch was a good shock, not a bad one. I thought the age when science was used for war was over, and that a glorious age of space exploration was dawning. The year I skipped ahead and got into MIT, Gagarin went into orbit, which made me more excited than ever. Of course, even back then, I knew the space race was just another facet of the Cold War. Mm, Moscow had a leg up on us, and we were desperate to catch up. I know. But for me, it was a happy time. I joined NASA, got to do the kind of research I loved. Our nation's prestige hinged on our work. They gave us whatever resources we asked for. I knew you could turn a rocket into an ICBM by fitting it with a nuclear warhead, but that didn't bother me so much. It didn't last long, though. The space and nuclear arms races took up enormous sums of money. America beat Russia to the moon, but that's where it ended. Then came detente. Exactly. NASA's budget was slashed as a result. My father being a nuclear expert and all, they put me to work on a more obvious deterrent. Missiles. At NASA, I'd been researching a locomotion system for lunar exploration. Tires aren't suited to driving around on the moon, you know. And that's how I caught Coldman's eye.
The aim of the Peace Walker Project is to achieve robust nuclear deterrence across Central America by deploying a new nuclear weapon system along the Caribbean coast. Peace Walker is also the name of the system itself. <sighs> a nuclear weapon named Peace. I can just see the look on Kaz's face. So why exactly does this new system need legs in the first place? Because it's a walker, an unmanned weapon moving under its own power and capable of launching a deterrent strike from anywhere. That's the whole idea behind Peace Walker. The reason Peace Walker is a mobile nuclear weapon system is to maximize its potential as a nuclear deterrent. How so? If need be, Peace Walker can stay constantly on the move so that the adversary can't pinpoint its position. That allows it to avoid preemptive enemy strikes. So you're saying it keeps the retaliation card in play? Coldman likes to brag about it in this way. Like a land-based version of an SSBN. And there's another reason for them to be mobile. Peace Walker also has a self-destruct function. Why would Peace Walker need a self-destruct function? You saw it, didn't you, Snake? That sphere on Peace Walker's head? Yeah. That's a hydrogen bomb. What? You're telling me that thing's a thermonuclear device? Do they have any idea what kind of destruction that thing would cause? I know, it's crazy. I mean, even overkill has its limits. If it's strategic value they want, they could have gone with something smaller. It's like they want a weapon on par with Russia's Tsar Bomba. This arms race is running way out of control. It's an evolutionary dead end. A saber-toothed tiger. You can't load a warhead that big on a missile, of course. And no strategic bomber could carry it. That's where Peace Walker comes in. So, it waltzes into enemy territory carrying a hydrogen bomb and blows itself up. Christ. The biggest nuclear warhead ever actually detonated was the Soviet RDS-220, nicknamed Tsar Bomba. It had an estimated yield of 57 megatons, 10 times as much power as all the explosives used throughout World War II. The test took place on October 30, 1961, above Novaya Zemlya. The explosion is believed to have created a fireball over two miles in diameter. Can you believe that? Like a miniature sun. The explosion was seen as far off as Finland, 600 miles away. And some people even reported windows shattering. The shock wave traveled three times around the Earth. Three times? Peace Walker is armed with a massive hydrogen bomb, even more destructive than Tsar Bomba. It can sneak into enemy territory, lie low, and in the event of an enemy nuclear strike, detonate itself in retaliation. And the locomotion system that lets it do that my research. Snake, those legs were supposed to make my dream come true. Now they're about to jump the fence of nuclear deterrence. You have to stop them. I'll apply all my energy into developing weapons and equipment to help you do it. Sounds like a deal. What made you put an AI into Peace Walker? Well, for one thing, because it can't be manned. Peace Walker's designed to enter enemy territory and blow itself up, if necessary. You can't put a person inside a weapon that could blow at any time, can you? So we equipped it with an AI instead. That's... strangely humane of you. And besides, Peace Walker was designed as a bipedal weapon system. You can't imagine how hard it shakes when it walks. It'd turn a man into mush. Plus, when launching a nuclear missile, it has to perform ballistic calculations in real time. See? Because it's always moving. Hold on. If that's all it does, then a high-performance computer ought to do the job. It doesn't need intelligence. That's a very good point, Snake. Which brings me to the real reason. Peace Walker needs AI to make decisions regarding nuclear retaliation. It's what ensures perfectly mutual assured destruction. I've heard all this before. You want a war between machines? We'd never actually launch the first nuke, of course. 
It's strictly a counterattack system. Only a politician could make such an illogical decision as starting a nuclear war. Conversely, if an adversary launches a nuke at us, the AI will not fail to retaliate. Therefore, the adversary can't launch. The AI guarantees it. Even so, launching nukes without authorization? Boomer captains have the authority to launch if land communications are cut off. It's the same principle. Not even the captain of a boomer can make that decision alone. The way I heard it, that's the only situation where insubordination is allowed. Only because humans are imperfect. That's Coldman's line of thinking. You're saying that machines don't make mistakes? That's a myth. Worse than that, it's blind faith. We wouldn't put our faith, our fate, into the hands of any ordinary machine. That's what the AI is for. The decision to launch a retaliatory strike requires high-level judgment. You have to take into account not only the state of the war, but the entire world. And sometimes, you need to make a guess based on incomplete information. Huh. You think an AI can do all that? Yeah. At least, Dr. Strangelove does. Peace Walker is fitted with several close-range weapons. We'd also planned for it to be able to enter enemy territory and self-detonate. Wonderful. What exactly are we dealing with here? Well, the flamethrowers, for one thing. One in the front and one in the rear. Then there are the S-mines. They're like cluster bombs. It scatters them from its leg hatches. If you see those open, you better clear out quickly. And finally, the rockets. These can travel quite a distance, so stay sharp. On the other hand, it can't fire them from too close. But then again, there are those flamethrowers. It can also use its legs as weapons against any infantry on the ground. Ouch. But remember, Peace Walker technically isn't complete. With just the reptile pod, it can only perform relatively simple maneuvers. They've got certain quirks, too. What's more, look carefully and you should be able to predict which attack is coming next. Okay, but why does Peace Walker need to walk on two legs? I think treads would be good enough. You'd be wrong. As you know, the terrain in Central America is rugged and complex, especially along the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. You've got jungles, swamps, mountains, and the only way to get across all that terrain, no matter how rugged, is on legs. Yeah, but wouldn't it be tough to cross a swamp, even on legs? It wasn't easy, that's for sure. The reason we picked Costa Rica as a proving ground is because we can test it on every type of terrain. This Peace Walker project the CIA's talking about, you believed in it, huh? Yeah, I believed. Actually, maybe I just wanted to believe. What do you mean? Here's how Coldman explained it. Peace Walker's a weapon for peace. One to ensure true nuclear deterrence. It'd be the anchor to bring stability to Central America. He told me, the nuclear weapon system you've built will never be used. It will forever stand vigil as an icon of peace. And to achieve that, he needed my bipedal locomotion technology. To be honest, I was flattered. Flattered? Wouldn't you be? My colleagues in the scientific community have never taken me seriously. They told me bipedal locomotion was a pipe dream, that it had never amount to anything. It was the first time anybody recognized my work. How could I not be happy? And besides, it was my chance to surpass my father. To create nukes for peace. Or so I thought, anyway. But Coldman's really going through with it. Yeah. Makes perfect sense, really. No one would give the project any notice unless they could prove that an unmanned system is capable of launching a nuke. Why is Coldman going to launch a nuke? If all he wants to do is prove the AI retaliation system works, he doesn't need to put a live warhead on it. I agree. He could demonstrate the system by launching the missile alone, without a warhead. I asked him the same thing at first. He said there was no point in using a dummy missile. That it had taken actual nuclear launch to deter potential enemies. Launching the real deal gives him a leg up in negotiations with Langley. 
That's what he's really after. I based the bipedal locomotion technology used in Peace Walker on Soviet research. Actually, I'll be honest with you. I stole most of the basic ideas behind it. Soviet? Bipedal? You mean Granin? You know him? Yeah. I met him at his lab in Russia. He helped me out a little bit. You met him? What were you... He was head of the Granin Design Bureau, creator of countless Soviet weapons. I'd hit a wall in my research at the time. Granin's ideas solved nearly all my problems. Uh, there's nothing unusual about using somebody else's work to further your own research, is there? As long as you cite it, yeah. But I wasn't in a position to do that. His research was classified at the highest level. Soviet research, no less. So you used it without telling anybody? I wanted to show up my colleagues for once. The ones who never took me seriously. But you reap what you sow. Coldman seized on that vulnerability. Told me if I quit the project, he'd expose my larceny. <laughs> he had you by the balls, Doc. How'd you get your hands on Gronin's research? That was also Coldman. He used his agency contacts to get a hold of it. Uh, giving you stolen information, then using it to blackmail you. Damn. I knew it was Gronin's work the minute I saw it. See, I'd been corresponding with him for a while. Corresponding? Letters. Between scientists doing the same kind of research. He always complained that nobody understood his ideas on bipedal locomotion. Ah, so you're the American friend he was talking about. Obviously, he didn't write a word about the technology in his letters. Except for one time. If by chance anything should happen to me, I entrust my research to you. Better that than handing it over to these ignorant so-called scientists. Huh. <laughs> Sounds like him, all right. Then one day, his papers actually came. It wasn't hard for me to imagine what had happened to him. I felt it was my duty to carry on his work after him. And also... What? I thought maybe combining his technology with mine could be a way to bring East and West together. Like the docking of Apollo and Soyuz. It'll never make the history books. And it's still not a reason to plagiarize. You're right. You're absolutely right. I never had the courage to tell the truth. That's all. I always looked for excuses to cover it up. Until now. Huh? You told me everything. You're no longer a coward. Metal Gear. Huh? What about it? You mumbled that when I first explained about Peace Walker. I'm curious what it meant. Exactly what it says. Uh, Metal Gear. Granin coined the term. Granin did? He thought of his technology as the metal gear that meshes infantry with artillery. I like the sound of that. Metal gear. It's got a nice ring to it. Better than an outright lie like Peace Walker, anyway. Those papers the CIA gave you, was there any data on the Shagohod in there? Shagohod? A nuclear tank that launches IRBMs. It competed against Granin's system for approval. Oh, the thing with the rockets. Designed by a guy named Sokolov, right? <laughs> What's so funny? No, I was just remembering some of the commentary Granin added to the Shagohod papers. You should have seen the way he badmouthed it. It was too conservative, too ugly. Uh, I can imagine. He was so angry when he wrote that, he smeared up the ink. And you know how shoddy the paper is over there to begin with. I'll bet. That's Granin, all right. Imagine accelerating the launcher itself to 300 miles an hour to extend the range of an IRBM. As stupid as it sounds, it's a hell of a concept. Who but the Soviets would think of using a tank as the first stage of a rocket? I actually took a cue from the Shagahod when I developed the pupa. That hovercraft thing? You stole that one too? Give me a little credit. I only borrowed the concept. The technology is original. As it turned out, hover technology wasn't enough to handle all the terrain in Central America. It relied too much on brute force. But the Shagohod was a major threat. That thing could corner like you wouldn't believe. 
Built pretty tough, too. You sure know a lot about it. Uh, it almost did me in. I couldn't forget it if I tried. Did you in? So you were the one who took it down. Wow! You really are amazing. I didn't do it alone. No, seriously, thank you. We might not be here today if they'd begun mass-producing that thing. Then again, they're hard at work now miniaturizing nuclear warheads. Pretty soon they won't even need an accelerated launcher like the Shagahod. Great. That means they're that much closer to being able to launch from anywhere in the world. Chico called Peace Walker the Basilisco. Basilisco? Oh, right, Spanish. <laughs> That's funny. I once used the code name Basilisk for the Peace Walker platform myself. What for? The class of lizards called basilisks can walk atop any type of terrain. In a pinch, they can even stand up on two legs and run across water. Perfect name for a system that can walk anywhere in Central America, right? Plus, there are the legends. What legends? The basilisks of legend were highly venomous creatures. There's a story told by the ancient Romans. A knight slew a basilisk by piercing it with his spear. The creature's poison seeped up the spear and killed both horse and rider. Remind you of anything, Snake? Nuclear deterrence. Bingo. Kill it, and you die along with it. Your hands are bound. I wanted Peace Walker to be like that. You should know that people aren't that rational. Sometimes people do things that don't make sense, even when they know they're going to die. Or maybe it's because of that. Maybe you're right. But that's exactly what I don't understand. So this Dr. Strangelove was at NASA? Yeah. Well, actually, Strangelove left for DARPA not long after I joined. And then the two of you ended up back together doing research in Costa Rica. Uh, not exactly together. We coordinated on a few things, but the research projects themselves were separate from each other. We had it worked out so that Dr. Strangelove handled the mammal pod, Peace Walker's cerebrum, while I did the rest. That letter... something to do with your research? Huh? Uh, well, no, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's a report. Research findings. Research findings? Anything in there we could use against Peace Walker? N nothing Nothing at all. Just don't read it, okay? Promise me you won't. Snake, how's the mule treating you? Uh, at this pace, I should be there by tomorrow morning. You've got to hurry. The AI could be completed any time now. It would be nice to have a guide. Already on it. I've enlisted Paz to help you. She knows the jungle pretty well. Snake, I know you are an expert in survival, but you need to stay alert. You are in an ancient jungle so foggy, you can hardly see the trees. 
It is home to 2,500 species of plants, including 400 types of orchids. There are also 500 species of butterflies and over 400 species of wild birds. The bedrock is solid enough that Mayan ruins have miraculously survived centuries of earthquakes. Uh, an AI lab in a Mayan ruin. Who'd have thought, hey, Huey? My sentiments exactly. That doesn't mean security is any less tight, though. You still have the ID card I gave you, don't you? Got it right here. That'll get you through the gate, no problem. After that, you're on your own. As long as the AI remains unassembled, Coldman's plans on ice. <laughs> What about security inside the lab? Well, it shouldn't be a problem for you. Strangelove demanded that the security presence inside the lab be kept to a minimum. It's not all good news, Snake. Coldman knows we're here. He's raised security in the area surrounding the lab. You'll be seeing a lot of that chrysalis UAV, and a bunch of patrol choppers, too. There may be scouts in the jungle lying in ambush. As you approach the lab, be extra vigilant. I'll be careful. is a few miles to the north. It won't be long before the AI is complete. Don't let that happen. Careful. If there's enemy scouts around here, they'll be nearly impossible to see. Watch out. Enemy search may not spot enemies that are actively hidden.
Somebody there? Nothing here. Bolton recovery subject confirmed on board helicopter. Dr. Strangelove's lab can't be much further. Hurry, Snake.
Thanks for putting me on the R&D team, Snake. I'll cut to the chase. We've commenced development on our own bipedal weapon. The only thing is, we don't exactly have easy access to resources here. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget of a defense department behind us. I understand. That's why I want to ask you something. If you fight any more AI weapons, could you try to gather as many of their parts as you can? That would really make things go a lot smoother. Again. Easier said than done. If anyone could do it, you can, boss. You single-handedly took out the pupa. True. Look, if you're not interested, I can just work with what we have here. I'm not trying to force you to take unnecessary risks. You're the boss around here. All right. No promises. But I'll think about it. Great. Also, each AI weapon has a head part that serves as the core of its armament. Recovering a head part will allow you to use the weapon associated with that part. But those guys won't go down without a fight, so don't get too preoccupied with this stuff. Don't worry. I'm not about to risk my life for a bunch of scrap. I would hope not. Uh, well, one more thing. Our new bipedal weapon needs a name. Mm, good point. We can't keep calling it our bipedal weapon. I had a talk with Miller, and we came up with Metal Gear Zeke. Metal Gear... Zeke? Yep. As you know, Metal Gear was coined by Granin. And Zeke? It's a name the US military gave to Japanese aircraft that flew during World War II. Zeke was the Japanese Navy's best fighter plane. So are you okay with that, Snake? <sighs> sure. Fine by me. Miller was saying that an army without borders will need a deterrent against other countries. He's right. With Metal Gear, MSF can achieve true independence. Here's hoping.
That's a hind. You've got to take it out somehow. Either neutralize the soldiers or bring down the chopper. Good luck. Catarata de la Muerte means waterfall of death. Huh. How cheerful. I am sure it will be no problem for you, Snake. Especially compared to all the dire situations you've faced in the past. Yeah, easy to say now. We'll see what really happens. Sorry. Still, you have surprised me. Everything they say about the legend is true. I'm neither hero nor legend. But for some reason... I don't mind you calling me that. Thanks. Be careful, Snake. Peace. Don't even think about facing a chopper head-on. Gorilla tactics would work well in a place like that. Moving from tree to tree will make it hard to get a fix on you from the air. That's your best chance. Good thinking, Commandante. You clearly know your way around a battlefield. Enough, boss. 
Time to stop talking and start using your ears. When you're hiding, you won't be able to see the chopper that well. It's important to use sound to get a read on its position. You could also try taking out its tail rotor. That would greatly reduce its mobility. And watch out for ground troops. Copy that, Commandante.
I'm starting to wonder if recruiting the soldiers with a Fulton isn't a little... heavy-handed? I already don't like where this is going. I think the voluntary approach could be more pragmatic. Technically, we're not a corporate entity, but at our size, that's not too far from the truth. We can't keep using guerrilla tactics to find new blood. To search for volunteers, select Recruit from the menu, or select Trade to exchange soldiers with other mercenary units. Yeah, provided we've got the friends for that.
Looks like our reputation is spreading. We've got battle-hardened veterans from all kinds of places trying to join our army. But they insist on testing your skills to see if you're the real deal before they'll join. Let's put these arrogant upstarts in their place. Take them down using hand-to-hand -hand strikes or CQC. If you can knock them all out within the time limit, they'll join us, becoming powerful allies. Don't disappoint them, boss. Show them what you got. Reporting for duty. That all you got? Okay, enough. Looks like our reputation. Thank you. 